Heart of Darkness, more like Fart of Darkness by Joseph Cumrag. Am I right, guys? <laughs> oh, um, welcome back to that book whose name I just said. We'll be continuing off on page uh, 78. Dear listener, you're making great progress. All of your fortunes will come to you within time, but only if you like, favorite, and subscribe. Otherwise, I will appear in your room at night and strangle you to death. Um, and that is a threat. <laughs> Take down the video. Take down the video. Anyways, um, yeah, let's continue. Uh, sleepless tales as always. Don't forget to like, subscribe, favorite, comment, like, and favorite, and subscribe. And, uh, let's get this show on the road. As a recap, the boat, uh, the, the steamboat that Marlowe's on was just attacked by young natives inside the young Heart of Darkness, as they saw. They had just reached uh, Kroot's, Kroot's, Kroot's Crucible's area, and, um, well, he's probably dead, so that's awkward. We're currently in the middle of an action um, where Marlowe's just coming to terms with the fact that, you know, Kroot's is dead. So, Kurtz, excuse me, Kurtz is dead, so that's kind of cringe. Um, so, yeah, let's press on. The other shoe went flying unto the devil god of that river, I thought. By Jove, it's all over. We're too late. He's vanished. The gift has vanished by, by means of some spear, arrow, or club. I'll never hear that chap speak at all. And my sorrow had a startling of extravagance and emotion, even such as I had noticed in the howling sorrow of these savages in the bush. I couldn't have felt more lonely desolation somehow. Had I been robbed of a belief, or had missed my destiny in life? Why do you sigh in this beastly way? Somebody. Absurd? Well, absurd. Good lord. Mustn't a man ever... <sighs> Here, give me some tobacco. There was a profound stillness, back on the boat from original. And then a match flared, and Marlowe's lean face appeared, a worn, a hollow, with downward folds and dropped eyelids with an aspect of concentration and attention. And as he took vigorous draws at his pipe, it seemed to retreat and advance out of the night in the regular flicker of tiny flame. The match went out. Absurd, he cried. This is the worst of trying to tell. Here you all are, all moored up with two good addresses, like a hulk with two anchors. The butcher round one corner, policemen around another, excellent appetites, Temperature normal, you hear. Normal from year's end to year's end, and you say absurd. Absurd be exploded. Absurd, my my dear boys, what can you expect from a man who out of sheer nervousness had just flung overboard a pair of new shoes? Now I think of it, it is amazing I did not shed tears. I am, upon the whole, proud of my fortitude. I was cut to the quick at the idea of having lost the inestimable privilege of listening to the gifted Kurtz. Of course I was wrong. The privilege was waiting for me. Oh yes, I heard more than enough. And I was right, too. A voice. He was very little more than a voice. And I heard him. Him. It. This. This voice. And other memories. All of them were so just little more than voices. And the memory of that time itself lingers around me. Impalpable. Like a dying vibration of one immense jabber, silly, atrocious, sordid, savage, or simply mean, without any kind of sense, voices. Voices, even the girl herself, now. He was silent for a long time. I laid the ghost of his gifts at last with a lie, he began, suddenly. Girl, what? Did I, did I mention a girl? Oh, she's out of it, completely. They, the women, I mean, are they're out of it, should be out of it. We must help them stay in that beautiful world of theirs, lest ours gets worse. Oh, she had to be out of it. You should have heard the disinterest body of Mr. Kurt saying, Oh, my intended. You'd have perceived directly then how completely she was out of it. And the lofty frontal bone of Mr. Kurtz? They say the hair goes on growing sometimes, but this, that specimen, was impressively bald. The wilderness had patted Mon at the head, and behold, was like a ball, an ivory ball. It had caressed him, and lo, he had withered. It had taken him, loved him, and embraced him, 
got into his veins and consumed his flesh and sealed his soul to its own by the way of inconceivable ceremonies of some devilish initiation. He was its spoiled and pampered favorite. Ivory, I should think so. Heaps of it, stacks of it. The old mud shanty was bursting with it. You'd think there was not a single tusk left either above or below the ground in the whole country. Mostly fossil, the man had tried to remark disparagingly. There's no more fossil than I am, but they call it fossil. When it's dug up, it appears these gamers do bury the tusk sometimes. But evidently, they couldn't bury this parcel deep enough to save the gifted Mr. Kurtz from his fate. We filled the steamboat with it, and had a pile lot on the deck. Thus, we could see and enjoy as long as we could have, because the appreciation of this favor had remained with them to the last. You should have heard him say, my ivory. Oh yes, I heard him. My intended, my ivory, my station, my river, my... Everything belonged to him. It made me hold my breath. An expectation of hearing the wilderness burst into a prodigious peal of laughter that would shake the fixed stars in their places. To everything belonged to him. But that was a trifle. The thing was to know what she belonged to. How many powers of darkness claimed him for their own. That was the reflection that made you creepy all over. It was impossible. It was not good for one either. I'm trying to imagine. He'd taken a high seat among the devils of the land, and I mean literally. You can't understand. How could you? With solid pavement under your feet, surrounded by kind neighbors ready to cheer you on and fall on you, stepping delicately between the butcher and the policeman, in the holy terror of scandal and gallows and lunatic asylums, how can you imagine what particular region of the first ages a man's untrammeled feet may take him into by the way of solitude? Utter solitude without a policeman. By the way of silence, utter silence. No warning voice of a kind neighbor can be heard whispering of public opinion. These little things make all the great difference. When they're gone, you must fall back on your own innate strength, upon your own capacity for faithfulness. Of course, you may be too much of a fool to go wrong, too dull even to know you are being assaulted by the powers of darkness. I take it. No fool ever made a bargain for his own soul with the devil. The fool is too much of a fool, or the devil too much of a devil. I don't know which. Or you may be such a thunderously exalted creature as to be altogether deaf and blind to everything but heavenly sights and sounds. Then the earth for you is only a standing place. And whether to be like this is your loss or your gain, I won't pretend to say. But most of us are neither one nor the other. The earth is for us a place to live in, where we must put up with sights and sounds and smells too. By Jove, breathe that hippo, so to speak, and not be contaminated. And there, don't you see, your strength comes in the faith of your ability for the digging of ostentatious holes to bury the stuff in. Your power of devotion, not to yourself, but to an obscure, back-breaking business. And that's difficult enough. Mind, I'm not trying to excuse or even explain. I'm trying to account for myself, for for Mr. Kurtz, for the shade of Mr. Kurtz. This initiated wraith from the back of nowhere honored me with its amazing confidence before it vanished altogether. This was because it could speak English to me. The original Kurtz had been educated partly in England as he was good enough to say himself his sympathies were in the right place. His mother was half English, his father was half French. All Europe contributed to the making of Kurtz, and by and by I learned that. Most appropriately, the international study of the suppression of savage customs had entrusted him with the making of a report for its future guidance, and he had written it, too. I've seen it, and I've, I've read it. It was eloquent. Vibrating with eloquence, but too high-strung, I think. Seventeen pages of close writing he had found time for, but this it must have been before his... Let's say nerves went wrong and caused him to preside at certain midnight dances ending with unspeakable rites, which as far as I reluctantly gathered from what I heard at various times were offered up to him. Do you understand? To Mr. Kurtz himself. But it was a beautiful piece of writing. The opening paragraph, however, in the light of later information strikes me now as ominous. He began with the argument that we whites, from the point of development we had arrived at, must necessarily appear to them savages in the nature of supernatural beings. We approach them with the might of a deity, and so on, but 
by the simple exercise of our will, we can exert a power for good, unpractically bounded, etc. From that point, he soared and took me with him. The peroration was magnificent, though d- difficult to remember, <laughs> you know. It gave me the notion of an exotic immensity ruled by an august benevolence. It made me tingle with enthusiasm. This was the unbounded power of eloquence, of words, of burning noble words. There were no practical hints to interrupt the magic current of phrases, unless a kind of note at the foot of the last page, scrawled evidently much later, in an unsteady hand, may be regarded as the exposition of a method. It was very simple, and at the end of that moving appeal to every altruistic sentiment, it blazed at you, luminous and terrifying. Like a flash of lightning in a serene sky. Exterminate all the brutes. The curious part was that he had apparently forgotten all about that valuable proscriptum, because later on, when he in a sense came to himself, he repeatedly entreated me to take good care of my pamphlet, he called it, as was sure to have in their fortune some influence upon his career. I had full information about these things, and besides, as it turned out, I was to have the care of his memory. I've done enough for it to give me the indisputable right to lay it, if I choose, for everlasting rest in the dustbin of progress, amongst all the sweepings and, figuratively speaking, all the dead cats of civilization. But then, you see, I can't choose. He won't be forgotten. Whatever he was, he was not common. He had the power to charm or to frighten rudimentary souls into an aggravated witch dance in his honor. He could also fill the small souls of the pilgrims with bitter misgivings. He had one devoted friend, at least. He had conquered one soul in the world that was neither rudimentary nor tainted with self-seeking. No, I can't forget him. Though I'm not prepared to affirm the fellow was exactly worth the life we lost in getting to him. I miss my late helmsman awfully. I missed him even when his body was still lying into the pilot house. Perhaps you'll think it passing strange as regret for a savage man who was no more than a grain of sand in a black Sahara. Well, don't you see... He had done something. He had steered. For months I had him at my back. The help, an instrument. It was a kind of partnership. He steered for me. I had to look after him. I worried about his deficiencies, and thus a stable bond had been created, of which I only became more aware when he was so suddenly broken. And the intimate profundity of that he gave me when he received his hurt remains on this day in a memory, like the claim of distant kinship affirmed in a supreme moment. Poor fool. If only he had left that shutter alone. He had no restraint, no restraint, just like Kurtz. A tree swayed by the wind, and as soon as I put on a dry pair of slippers, I dragged him out. After first jerking the spear out of his side, which operation I confessed, I performed with my eyes shut tight. His heels leaped together over the little doorstep. His shoulders were pressed against my breast. I hugged him from behind desperately. Oh, he was heavy. Heavy and... Heavier than any man on earth, I should imagine. Then, without any more ado, I tipped him overboard. The current snatched him as though he had been a wisp of grass, and I saw the body roll over twice before I lost sight of it forever. All the pilgrims and the manager were then congregated on the awning deck about the pilot house, chattering at each other like a flock of excited magpies. And there was a scandalized murmur at my heartless promptitude. What they wanted to keep that body hanging about for, I can't guess. Embalmment, maybe. But I also heard another, and a very ominous murmur on the deck below. My friends, the woodcutters, were likewise scandalized. It was a better show of reason than I admit that the reason itself was quite inadmissible. Though quite. I had made up my mind that if my late helmsman was to be eaten, the fishes alone would have him. He had been a very second-rate helmsman, well alive, but now he was dead, and he might have been a first-class temptation and possibly cause some starting trouble. Besides, I was anxious to take the wheel. The man in pink pajamas showing himself a hopeless duffer at the business. This I did directly, and the simple funeral was over. We were going half speed, keeping right in the middle of the stream, and I listened to the talk about me. They had given up Kurtz. They had given up the station. Kurtz was dead, and the station had been burnt, and so on, and so on. The red-haired pilgrim was beside himself with the thought that at least this poor Kurtz had been properly avenged. Say, you must have made a glorious slaughter of them in the bush, huh? What do you think, say? He positively danced. 
the bloodthirsty little gingery beggar. And he had nearly fainted when he saw the wounded man. I could not help saying, he made a glorious lot of smoke anyhow. I had seen, from the way the tops of the rustles brushed and flew, that almost all the shots had gone too high. Can't hit anything unless you take aim and fire from the shoulder. But these chaps fired from the hip with their eyes shut. The retreat, I maintained, and I was right, was caused by the screeching of the steam whistle. Upon this, they forgot Kurtz and began to howl at me with indignant protests. The manager stood by the wheel, murmuring confidently about the necessity of getting well away down the river before dark at all events. When I saw in the distance a clearing on the riverside and the outlines of some sort of building. What's this? I asked. He clapped his hands in wonder. At the station, he cried. I edged in at once, still going half speed. Through my glasses, I saw the slope of a hill, interspersed with rare trees and perfectly free from undergrowth. A long, decaying building on the summit was half buried in the high grass. The large holes of the peaked roof gaped back from afar. The jungle and the woods made a background. There was no enclosure or fence of any kind, but there had been one, apparently, for near the house, half a dozen slim posts remained in a row, roughly trimmed, and with their upper ends ornamented with round, carved balls. The rails, or whatever they had been between, had disappeared. Of course, the forests surrounded all that. The riverbank was clear, and on the water side, I saw a white man under a hat, like a cartwheel, beckoning persistently with his whole arm. Examining the edge of the forest above and below, I was almost certain I could see movements, human forms gliding here and there. I steamed past prudently, then stopped the engines and let her drift down. The man on the shore began to shout, urging us to land. We've been attacked, screamed the manager. I know, I know, it's all right, yelled back the other, as cheerful as you please. Come along, it's all right, I'm glad. His aspect reminded me of something. I had seen something funny, I had seen somewhere. As I maneuvered to get alongside, I was asking myself, what does this fellow look like? And suddenly I got it. He looked like a harlequin. His clothes had been made of the stuff that was brown holland, probably. It was covered with patches all over with bright blue, red, and yellow, patches on the back, patches on the knees, patches on the elbows, and colored binding around his jacket, the scarlet edging at the bottom of his trousers, and the sunshine made him look entirely gay and wonderfully neat withal. Because you could see how beautifully all this patching had been done, a beardless, boyish face, very fair, no features to speak of, a nose peeling, little blue eyes, smiles and frowns chasing each other over that open countenance like sunshine and shadow on a wind-swept plain. Look out, Captain, he cried. There's a snag lodged in here last night. What? Another snag? I confess I swore shamefully. I nearly hold my cripple to finish off that charming trip. The harlequin on the bank turned his little pug nose up to me. Are you English? he asked. All smiles. Are you? I shouted from the wheel. His smiles vanished, and he shook his head as if just sorry for my disappointment. And he brightened up. Never mind, he cried encouragingly. Are we in time, I asked. He's up there, he replied, with a toss of his head up the hill. And becoming gloomy all of a sudden, his face was like the autumn sky. Overcast one moment, and bright the next. When the manager, escorted by the pilgrims, all of them armed to the teeth, had gone up to the house, this chap came on board. I say I don't like this. These natives are in the bush, I said. He assured me honestly that it was all right. They're simple people, he added. Well, I'm glad you came. It took me all my time to keep them off. But you said it was all right, I cried. Oh, they meant no harm, he said. And as I stared, he corrected himself. Well, not exactly, then vivaciously. My faith, your pilot house, wants a clean-up. In the next breath, he advised me to keep enough steam on the boiler to blow the whistle in case of any trouble. One good screech will do more than you and all your rifles. They're simple people, he repeated. He rattled away at such a rate, he quite overwhelmed me. He seemed to be trying to make up for lots of silence, and actually hinted, a laughing, that such was the case. Don't you talk with Mr. Kurtz, I asked. You don't talk with that man, you listen to him. He exclaimed with severe exultation. But now, he waved his arm, and the twinkling of an eye was in the uttermost depths of despondency. In a moment, he came up again with a jump, possessed himself with both of my hands, and 
shook them continuously. While he gabbled, a brother sailor, honor, pleasure, delight, inter- <laughs> Russian, son of an archpriest, government of Tambov. What? Tobacco. English tobacco. The excellent English tobacco. Now that's brotherly. Smoke? Where's a sailor that does not smoke? The pipes soothed him, and gradually I made out he had run away from school and gone to sea in a Russian ship, and ran away again, served some time in English ships, and was now reconciled with the archpriest. He made a point of that. But when one is young and must see things, gather experience, the ideas, enlarge his mind. Here, I interrupted. You can't ever tell. Here I met Mr. Kurtz, he said, youthfully, solemnly, and reproachful. I held my tongue after that. It appears he had persuaded that trading house on the coast to fit him out with stores and goods, and had started for the interior with a light heart, and no more idea what happened to him than a baby. He had been wandering about that river for nearly two years alone, cut off from everybody and everything. I'm not so young as I look. I'm 25, he said. At first old Van Schooten would tell me to go to the devil, he narrated with keen enjoyment. But I stuck to him, and talked and talked, till at last he got afraid I would talk the hind leg off his favorite dog. So he took me some cheap things and a few guns, and told me he hoped he would never see my face again. Good old Dutchman, Van Schooten. I've sent him one small lot of ivory a year ago, so he can't tell me a little thief when I come back. I hope he got it. For the rest, I don't care. I've seen some wood stacked for you. That was my old house, did you see? I gave him Towson's book. He made as though he would kiss me, but restrained himself. Ah, the only book I had left. I thought that I had lost it, he said, looking at it ecstatically. And so many accidents happen to a man going about alone, you know. Canoes get upset sometimes, and sometimes you gotta clear out so quick when the people get angry. He thumbed the pages. You made notes in Russian, I asked. He nodded. I thought they were written in cipher, I said. <laughs> he laughed, then became serious. I had lots of trouble to keep these people off, he said. Did they want to kill you? I asked. No, oh, no, he cried and checked himself. Why did they attack us? I pursued. He hesitated, then said shamefully, They didn't want him to go, don't they? I said curiously. He nodded, a nod full of mystery and wisdom. I tell you, he cried, this man has enlarged my mind. He opened his arms wide and staring at me with his little blue eyes. They were perfectly round. Zooey mama, guys. That's the end of part two. Part two, guys. Part two. Um. Oh, only one more part to go. We're on page 90 now. 90 out of, what's well, like one, I think 30. Soup, 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 soup. Yeah, 130. So, we'll have three more parts, and then, um... That'll be it for Art of Darkness. You're doing great, dear reader. I hope you press on. Um, I, I have no wisdom for you tonight. However, I will say good night because I love you and I care about you more than you could possibly know. Um, and with that, goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this reading, and I'll catch you in the next part. Goodbye. <laughs>